Hello, everybody. My name is Neil Robson. I'm editor of the borough's principal heritage magazine, The Ones With Historian. As we look back through the many long years to the very start of the Queen's reign, here is an opportunity to reassess the outburst of interest in the design for postage stamps right across the Commonwealth to celebrate her coronation. I live in Southfields, and in 2012, uh, the road where I live organized a street party to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee. There's my house in the background, there's the Queen on the front door. For those of you who are interested, there in the forefront to the right uh, is Pudsey, uh, a dog of great uh, outstanding competence that did so well during Britain's Got Talent that summer. Here we are 10 years on, 2022, and we're going to hold another party to celebrate, celebrate the Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee. One of the things that we're going to do, amongst many, many other things, is put up a small display of reproductions of stamps that were issued almost 70 years ago. And it's going to take the form of a collage of six different designs, and here, is the result of my background preparations for that little display. Let's start with Australia. Australia, a senior dominion within the Commonwealth. And this is the design that they brought out in the week before Coronation Day, the 2nd of June, 1953. You will see, uh, 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 technically, it is uh, a lovely, um, has a lovely impact. It's a bold line engraved design. It's rather like a banknote in a way. To the right, there's the Queen, photographed by the Society photographer Dorothy Wilding, an, uh, an amazing lengthy session at their studios, only a handful of weeks after the death of the king. The photograph took, was taken on the 26th of February, 1952. When you see the Australian uh, designer chose uh, a strong image, um, it's shoulder length. We see more of the form of the sovereign there. It's not just a little element like you see on the back of a coin. I think perhaps that's an attempt to emphasize the humanity behind the um, awesome authority, uh, superficially at least, of the monarchy. So the Queen's looking out towards us. The left hand side is of interest. Um, now there they could have had just a vignette, a picture, say of the, just the crown on its own or Buckingham Palace, but the designer didn't. Um, and here we have uh, almost an example of poster art. The hand the background is this large sunburst is this, I wonder, a metaphor for the dawn of a new Elizabethan age where hopes were so high? Then you've got the crown itself. That's St. Edward's crown. Uh, that is the piece that's used to uh, crown the sovereigns in Britain. And in the front, almost swamping it, is that, that block of text defining the whole purpose uh, of the stamp. It's a statement. Uh, it almost looks like a window display, doesn't it? But I will give it credit because um, the stamp does what it says on the tin. It commemorates this major event. Uh, the, the stamps were printed in Melbourne locally. Uh, the design came from Frank Manley, who was a prolific designer in Australia over many years particularly focusing on minuscule design, we might say, in postage stamps and such like. The authorities wanted three different values and they decided to go with the same design. I highlight this because this is a marked contrast with what, with what happened a couple of thousand kilometers away to the east, because New Zealand decided to go for the dog's breakfast policy. Look at this lot. Um, of their set of five different stamps came from two different designers, two different printers. Printers were based in Britain, so the whole lot once produced had to be shipped out right across to the other side of the world. 
But I've chosen uh, for us to consider uh, the one of the five, which I think is the best, and even at the time was considered uh, to be the best design. And it's this one, the Trupney Sepia stamp. Uh, now this is the work of James Berry. James Berry uh, was um, uh, an outstanding designer of considerable impact in that whole region, the South Pacific generally. He did medals, he did coins, and he did stamps. Uh, it is to his credit that he decided that he wanted to tie by some sort of symbolism uh, the design with the very territory that was issuing it. So you will notice those thin vertical borders on either side, and they take the form of Maori motifs. So far, so good. But then, ah, the heavy hand of authority. The authorities determined that he would have to include those deathless words, postage and revenue. And as you can see, the poor chap stuck them vertically. Vertically, I ask you, on top of his Maori symbols, and quite frankly, he sapped all interest out of them. What a pity. Nevertheless, the choice of the portrait of, of Queen Elizabeth was a great one. This is a superb one. Come out of that same photo session. There she is, side-faced. Uh, and look, uh, look at that wonderful artifact uh, upon her head. It's an astonishing item of jewelry. It is encrusted in pearls and in diamonds. It's a diadem, it's not a tiara. It's a circlet with joined round the back. It was made for King George IV in 1820 under his commission for him to use the following year at his coronation. At the time it cost more than 8,000 pounds. And I think that puts it in the league nowadays at a cost of well over 2 million pounds. As chance would have it, it's a particularly apt choice because when Coronation Day did finally dawn over in London, here's a press photo of the Queen arriving at the annex in front of Westminster Abbey that morning. And sure enough, upon her head, she is wearing that diadem. Here's another photo from that marathon session. This time, as you see, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth is seated in a gilt edge chair. You can see the gold damask to her gown and the sash of the Order of the Garter that she's wearing. It's a full face portrait. She's staring straight at us. I'm showing this because this was precisely the source for the stamp issued by Ceylon. Now, from our own perspective of the 21st century, it might be tempted to say Ceylon. Why did Ceylon issue a coronation stamp? Well, in February 1948, uh, the state attained independence and took on the form of dominion status. So that means in 1953, Elizabeth II was the queen of Ceylon. There's a contrast there with India and Pakistan, which by then had become republics and didn't bother to participate. Uh, stamp wise uh, in any festivities. For the record, Ceylon became a republic, the Republic of Sri Lanka in 1972. Now, this is a small stamp, the size of the little ones that we have on our letters whenever we do receive them these days. So it's not a big stamp. It's produced by Bradbury Wilkinson. Now, they're security uh, printers and they were based not far from many of us, just down the road in New Malden. Take a look at it. It ought not to work. It's an absolute mess. Bits and bobs all over the place. Uh, there are those over sturdy vertical panels which can't fail to add to the claustrophobia of the design. Uh, they, uh, you may be interested to know, they are based on the architectural decorations that you might see in Singhalese temples. There's the word coronation, and there's the date in what designers sometimes refer to as outline face font. Okay, that's good. If you understand English, that's good. 
But of course, if you don't understand English, it's not, not very useful at all, is it? Notice also the territory appears its name no fewer than three times. There it is in English language at the top, whilst down at the bottom, it's shown in Tamil and in Singala. But of course, what wins out is this particular choice of portrait. It is wonderful. There is the monarch staring straight out. She's looking at us, us the viewers, and as it were, is drawing us back into the whole purpose, the whole justification of example of world place. And we might say, those of us of a fanciful nature, actually involving us in the event itself. And in my view, it's that that makes it a success after all. Now, of course, for this collage of six, which we brought together, uh, naturally, I, I couldn't possibly leave out uh, some of the examples of the British stamps in that coronation summer. Let's look at this one first. It's the Tapney Hakeney. That was the basic letter rate. It was designed by a man called Edgar Fuller. When you hear that he was a heraldic artist, that starts, ex begins to explain quite a lot about this curious and yet ultimately very successful design. Because it's full of drama, uh, it's a very theatrical design, I think, it breaking the, the mold, certainly the conventions of that time, to a large extent. Their center stage is the queen, quite right, too. Without her, we'd have had no coronation, of course. You may note it's the same pose as was used in Australia, though it's been cropped rather tighter. And in turn, it's the same pose as was starting to appear on brand new stamps in Britain at that time, although here it is much larger. Then Edgar Fuller really goes to town because in his backdrop, you will notice um, they are, there are two olive branches. The olive is the symbol of peace and friendship. And I'm really impressed by these. Um, it's his carefully controlled symmetry that wins out here. And they curve and they almost embrace in a dignified but an affectionate fashion, they em embrace the queen herself. And they cause our eyes to curve around her. And then the very forefront of his stage, almost with a translucent curtain, perhaps you might say, there is added, applique fashion, of some of the elements from the regalia of the coronation. You can see the two crowns. You see on the bottom left-hand side, the orb. And on the right-hand side, the ampulla. That's the uh, eagle-shaped vessel containing the sacred oil. They shouldn't work, I don't feel, as well as they do. We see through them and we can see beyond, and so that gives it a depth, uh, a theatricality, which uh, I think is very impressive. Where the design did store at the time, this one was printed in utter millions and millions, because it was on sale for a couple of months, was that the authorities, the design panel, chose it for the basic way for stamp. Uh, it was printed in photogravia by Harrison and Sons, and by default, it had to attract the color of that value. And so this scarlet or crimson shade was used by their technicians at the time, was described by their technicians at the time as Carmen Red, and that brought out Fuller's design to the, to the full. If it had been allocated to one of the other values, if it had been printed, say, in a dark blue or a shade of olive, I have no doubt um, it would have drained quite a bit of the, uh, of the dramatic element out of that design. Here's another one from the, the British series. It's the one on Trockney Green. Now, the moment and the images of this appeared in the press, it caused great controversy. We are in the presence of a Marmite moment. For some, looking back, 
it was arguably one of the greatest contributions to all the whole decorative facet of that astonishing festival that summer. For others, it was a shabby little shocker. It was melodramatic and it was tawdry. The stamp was the work of this chap, Edmund Dulac. Dulac was born in Toulouse in 1882, and he acquired British nationality in 1912. His name may ring a bell with you because his particular claim to fame was to design illustrations for children's fairy tale style books, that genre that flourished particularly in the Edwardian and, um, and just beyond the First World War. And that's where his main claim to fame is, as well as his stamp design. Uh, he uh, held no, no uh, great uh, keenness, a truck, we might say, for photographs in stamps. No, no, as far as he was concerned, um, they had to be artistic. So he actually painted this portrait of the Queen. Dare we whisper it? It's not terribly good, is it? Obviously, obviously, you see the context, we know who it is from that, but take that away, it is not absolutely clear who, who, who in heaven's name is actually supposed to be. It's also preposterous for those of you who may be interested in the, um, the elements of, of the coronation, very littered itself, um, the sovereign is crowned by that crown. And Edwards, that's the only time they ever wear it in their lives. They wear it for about 50 minutes during the ceremony. During that period, no sovereign handles the orb, no sovereign is enrobed in ermine. So this is pure fantasy uh, and it would never happen well in real life. But Edmund Dulac really scored, I think, in the background. This is his attempt at a pastiche of Elizabethan tapestry or wall hanging. I don't think it's absolutely great. People commented at the time from the post office and they saw a sheet of these stamps, just what amazing, amazing impact they had, unlike the others, which was just a load of rectangles. If you looked at like this block of four, it draws your eyes vertically. And if it were possible, it draws your eyes diagonally as well and carries them outside the field of each individual stamp and this really is impressive. It strikes me the only parallel I can think of and I'm well aware I'm mixing my eras but the only parallel I can think of are some of the more impressive wallpapers by William Morris in the 1880s which again carries your eyes right up on the covering of a wall and so it's that. Uh, uh, to me, uh, it, the overall impact, the drama, uh, and the controversy perhaps that makes this quite an exciting stamp, which still is a source of comment, even down to our own time. So we're coming towards our close, stamp number six, and I've saved the best till last, which is this uh, amazing creation. As you may know, in the early 1950s, Britain governed, it ruled, or we should say, something like 40 colonies and dependencies. It was decided early on that in celebration of the coronation, each of those territories should have uh, a single stamp in a consistent design. It's what philatelists refer to as an omnibus issue. Bradbury Wilkinson once again were brought into play and he went to their design studio to design the stamp and to engrave it. The designer, he or she, went back for inspiration to the very beginning of British colonial stamp design and they chose this one as their basis. So you see this dates from as far back as 1861 and it's from what was then the island colony of Grenada in the Caribbean. And look, there's Queen Victoria. And look what she's got on her head. There's George IV diadem once more. The basis for that portrait was a state portrait created in 1837 by the Swiss artist Alfred Chanon. 
But the background in the 1860s, uh, this, uh, sorry, this background was uh, engine turned. So that means it was mechanically engraved, it didn't have an individual craftsman uh, cutting into the steel uh, line by line. Come forward 90 years to 1953, and this is how that design translated across. It's a different pose, a new pose for Queen, again taken on that mammoth session in February 1952 uh, with Dorothy Wilding. Queen is in a different gown. And she's wearing on her head a, a tiara that was given to her by her grandmother, Queen Mary. Uh, to celebrate her own wedding in 1947. The tiara dates back to 1893 originally. The decision was made with hindsight, it's such a no-brainer, it was made that every one of the stamps right across the Commonwealth should have the cameo in the center should be printed in black. And as you can see, that brings out to the fullness the talented skill uh, of the engraver here. But the surrounds, uh, the range of colors were offered uh, and uh, the different colors appear across different territories. This one I've chosen is for, the, uh, for Basuto land, which was a British colony in Southern Africa and is now the kingdom of Lesotho. And I've chosen this one because this is my favorite color. And this is reddish purple. Simply sensational. Just think about it. You could have owned a work of art for the princely sum of tuppence. So we draw to our close. Whilst I was researching uh, for this project, I came across a small number of full page color advertisements that appeared in the British press during that fortnight that surrounded the coronation itself. This is the one that I like, personally like the best. And this appeared in picture posts on the final week of May, 1953. For those of you of a certain age, you may even recognize the product angles. They were rock hard little sweets, square, as you can see, vividly colored and had quite distinctive chemically fruity taste. Well, I love this picture. Crowds waving, crowds smiling, and from the top left-hand corner, those exuberant ribbons uh, just conveying an element of, of rejoicing and of happiness. It's as if the advertiser's message to us is, suck a spangle as you watch all the horses go by. 1950s undeniably was an era of great maturity, uh, of great sophistication, and I think we can argue of a considerable amount of confidence. And yet, looking back from our own present traumatized standpoints, I have to say, it feels like an era of great innocence. Thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>